is, is there any movement to make, I'm not going to repeat the word defense, I'm going to call it militarism and wars and aggression, non-profit, take the profit out of it. Um, uh, of course, it is a brilliant idea uh, that would succeed tremendously in reducing warfare. Um, it, it's something that 80 years ago this year, a congressional committee famously recommended. Uh, this was the Nye Committee, NYE was the last name of the, the senator heading up the committee. Uh, but this was a committee that looked at war profiteering during World War I, years after that war, and looked at the influence of war profiteers on foreign policy and their uh, sabotaging of disarmament agreements uh, and the, their corrosive effect uh, as described years later by Eisenhower. This was the military industrial complex in the making. Uh, and this committee recommended not doing away with war, as I would like, but nationalizing it, making, making the weapons uh, part of the government uh, rather than belonging to private corporations. Um, we have, you know, now, of course, world globe-trotting uh, war profiteers without any pretense of loyalty to any particular nation, like Eric Prince of Blackwater and 15 other names of companies. Uh, it, war profiteering has become entirely acceptable uh, in the United States. Uh, you can go to just about any art museum or the U.S. Institute of so-called peace down near the Lincoln Memorial and find carved in stone the names of the biggest weapons companies uh, as respectable funders. Right? It, it is one of the biggest industries in the United States. Uh, another person who recommended the same idea recently was a guy named uh, the Pope who spoke to a joint session of Congress and said, you have blood on your hands, end the arms trade, and they stood up and cheered and escalated the arms trade. Uh, and, and I think it's, you know, it's worth understanding that although the U.S. is the biggest, most frequent maker of war on Earth, and spends the most, uh, almost as much as all the other countries put together, most of those other countries, its close allies, on making wars and preparing for wars, uh, the big business uh, of the U.S. weapons companies is overseas. Uh, and the big business of the U.S. State Department is as a marketing firm for those companies. Uh, and we look at a region like the Middle East and say, why is it so violent without understanding that the majority of the weapons were made and shipped from the United States. Uh, and, and so I actually think that although taking something profitable out of a government that's paid with those profits is, is one of the harder things to do, there might be advantages strategically for us as activists in going after the international arms trade that doesn't involve having to take on the, the patriotism and nationalism and loyalty to the U.S. military and the, and the darn troops that you have to support and so forth, although we have to take those on. Uh, it, so I, I think, you know, if people begin to understand that Saudi Arabia gave the Clinton Family Foundation over $10 million, and then Boeing gave Secretary of State Hillary Clinton while she was doing the deal $900,000, and then she waived all restrictions and said, give those planes to Saudi, sell those planes to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they are now bombing men, women, and children in Yemen uh, to the benefit of nobody other than the Clinton Family Foundation and Bill and Hillary. There, we could at least develop the shame that existed 80 years ago uh, to the point where somebody like that couldn't run for president of the United States. Here, thoughts on the bombing of the Doctors Without Border Hospital, um, possibly the one in Kunduz, uh, Afghanistan, as there have been several, uh, including in Yemen, uh, suspiciously as possible uh, revenge for the uproar that that organization made in Afghanistan. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the United States military very clearly knew where it was bombing, knew what it was bombing, uh, bombed it because it thought there were enemies there, didn't care 
that it was a hospital. Didn't think anyone would hold it accountable uh, for blowing up a hospital. Uh, and thus far has been proven right in that regard. Um, I mean, this, the United States military does not believe that the so-called rules of law apply to it. Now, I, I usually have trouble with the rules of law because one of the rules of law is that, uh, one of the rules of war, sorry, it, it is that war itself is a crime. Uh, but if you pretend for a minute that the war itself is not a crime, uh, and you look for particular violations uh, of particular laws of war, uh, the United States military targets hospitals, journalists, rescuers of the injured in a so-called double tap strike, uh, triple tap strikes, people trying just to get bodies to bury them, uh, uses new forms of napalm, uses firebombs, uses white phosphorus as a weapon, depleted geranium as a weapon, uh, burns everything under the sun in fire pits, poisoning the air of everyone around. I mean, the, the United States military is the most lawless institution on earth and has been since before Smedley Butler uh, declared himself as a, as a member of the US military a far grander criminal than, than Al Capone. Uh, and so when people talk about ISIS as the biggest, best funded terrorist organization in the world, they're overlooking the Pentagon. Uh, because it does not comply with any laws of war. Uh, it, it objects when other nations do things that it has done. Um, and the hypocrisy is incredible, and the lies are incredible, and the fact that they couldn't have the decency to simply apologize for blowing up the hospital when enough fuss was raised by white people with enough international connections and media savvy uh, the fact that John Kerry could go to Hiroshima today and, and not apologize and still make pretenses about the justifiability of nuking cities uh, tells you how, how lawless this institution is. About uh, the future of the U.S. drone program and about the uh, propaganda film I mentioned briefly earlier, Eye in the Sky, uh, you know, in, in 2011 and again this year, the White House has been making noises about how it can shut down the drone program in case a Republican might get his hands on it. Because if a Republican were to start going through a list of men, women, and children on Tuesdays and picking who to murder and having them murdered, well, that would be a bad thing. I mean, that, would, that would be really unpleasant. So, and of course, if it had been a Republican, uh, back in 2012, who had gone to the New York Times and said, let everybody know that I'm going through a list of men, women, and children and picking who to kill and having them killed, there would have been an uproar. The streets of the city would have been filled with protest. Uh, the question is, when and if a Republican moves into the White House and takes over a program that has been established and accepted as a good liberal humanitarian murder program, uh, how greatly will the uproar and the, and the outrage be diminished? Uh, that's hard to say, but it's not hard to say that any president uh, who moves in there uh, will continue the program. For one thing, because they all say they will. Yes, including Senator Sanders. Uh, and uh, you know, when I say all, yes, I am leaving out the good parties and referring just to the two mega parties. But, um, I, I think uh, there has been a history for centuries now of presidents creating new imperial powers, handing them on to the next president, uh, and having them consolidated and accepted. The, the Supreme Court maintains that once two presidents do something, it's legal. Richard Nixon claimed that once one president did something, it was legal. Uh, you know, so does so does Barack Obama, for that matter. Uh, and, so I, I think there is, there is little question that absent a massive popular movement to stop it, uh, 
there will th this program will continue, and it will continue uh, in several other countries and dozens of countries that now have the technology and the attempt to do the same thing. And it's going to get very, very ugly. Um, and you know, the idea that a drone war is better than a ground war that they used to say about places like Yemen, even though we never had a ground war and knew the drone war was going to create a larger war, it, it has sort of been dropped. You know, now the, the question is just whether you can somehow prevent all the other countries from having drone wars. But, uh, and, and of course there's a movement to prevent automated drones that kill without uh, a, a human drone in a, in a uniform pushing a button, which, you know, morally is just not much of a, of a difference, even if technologically it's somewhat exciting. Um, the, the, but yeah, by all means, we should prevent those and move on to preventing the, uh, the drones that require a human. Uh, but the, this movie, Eye in the Sky, I mean, I've talked about this a lot. Some people may have, may have heard this from me, but I went to the premiere down the street from here uh, a few weeks ago when the director was there and he had a, a U.S. Uh, general sitting next to him. And they flew a little drone around the theater and said, see, it's all true. Uh, but this was, a, and, and it's a movie that is, that does not depict itself as propaganda. The people walking out of the movie are coming out of there scratching their heads and thinking they've seen a very serious moral dilemma and a solemn decision-making process about whether to allow collateral damage, meaning the murder of children and so forth. But in fact, this is a movie, and I'm not I don't think I'm ruining it for you by, by telling you a few of the facts. I mean, I think it's ruined by its director, but uh, this is a movie in which, it, it, but it has the best production values and the best actors and actresses, and you know, after a dozen good drone movies that I didn't even realize, I didn't even notice they were all sort of on our side until this bad one came out. But this is the one everybody's gonna see. And, and this, it, it, this is the one where, they have a group of terrorists, including a white woman from England, so it's not racist, in Somalia, right? And they premiered this the same weekend that they claimed to kill 150 unknown people in Somalia, but they're all militants. Uh, this, this group of terrorists goes into a neighborhood controlled by Al-Shabaab, so they cannot be arrested. Uh, and they go into a house and they send a little drone the size of a bug in there with a camera to watch the people strapping on the suicide vests, getting ready to go out and blow people up in a shopping mall or something. So they actually, honest to God, are an imminent threat to somebody. They are not as required by Obama's doctrine an imminent threat to the United States because they are not going to jump across the Atlantic Ocean, but they are actually, unlike any, any other case, any case in reality, any actual use of US drone technology, they are an actual imminent threat to someone and they can't be arrested, and they're identified, and their whole stories are known, and so forth. So, in all of those regards, is completely unlike reality. And I asked the director, is there any case that resembles this in any way, in reality? And he said, no, but there could be. No, there, there couldn't be. There couldn't be. Then he went into a bunch of game theory moral dilemmas from academia about should you pull the switch to send the trolley on the track to kill one person instead of five people? And all these nonsense ticking time bomb scenarios that do not exist in reality, but allow a bunch of academics to fantasize about murdering children. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's propaganda. Uh, and, you know, the best propaganda fools even the people who make it. Uh, but uh, I've got flyers on my websites that you should take to, that, to the theaters that are showing that film and talk to people about reality. It's too loud. Uh, so the, the, devil, the question is about a new book which I highly, highly recommend by David Talbot called The Devil's Chessboard, uh, which looks at the, the Allen brothers, the, the Dulles brothers, uh, and uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, and the, and the origins of, I also recommend uh, another book by another author called The Brothers, which came out about a year ago maybe. But uh, it looks at the, uh, the origins of the CIA uh, and the extent to which the CIA has undermined U.S. government, sabotaged congressional and presidential policies, uh, assassinated presidents, uh, assassinated foreign presidents, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and it's uh, you know, and I can't swear to every detail in it, but it is very, very well done. Um, 
and uh, I think well worth reading uh, because it is relevant to today. Um, I, I mean, I don't. Uh, the thing about the United States today is that you don't need to know any secrets to know that the United States is engaged in vicious, destructive, completely illegal activities as its primary reason for existence. I, I mean, there is there, the wars no longer have congressional authorizations, the wars no longer have UN authorizations, the wars no longer pretend to comply with the so-called laws of war, to, never mind the laws against launching wars. Uh, you have troops armed and trained by the CIA in Syria fighting against troops armed and trained by the Pentagon in Syria. Right? So, you, you, I mean, the, the lawless chaos of it uh, should strip away giving too much credence uh, to the idea of, uh, of wisdom and ability uh, and, and, uh, and power for these people. Um, but they have been freed up from the restraints of law, from accountability, uh, from having to face consequences uh, for what they do. And so, you know, while once upon a time the CIA had to overthrow governments in secret or assassinate in secret, right, you now have the State Department quite openly supporting a coup in Honduras, launching a coup in Ukraine, you have the president very openly assassinating people every week uh, with missiles. Um, so, you know, the, uh, including from the CIA. So, the, so, you know, there is there is a permanent government in the United States. Uh, there is a structure of permanent bureaucrats and spies and lobbyists uh, that don't go away. Uh, that maintain the same policies regardless of presidential administration to a great degree. Uh, and when President Obama has supposedly repeatedly said, according to credible sources, you know, I don't want done to be what was done to Martin Luther King, I don't want to be the next Kennedy, and so forth, uh, that deserves a certain credibility, but not an ounce of respect. <laughs> you know, you cannot take a job uh, where your life is guaranteed to be at risk and not be willing to risk your life to stop slaughtering hundreds of thousands of other people uh, and sending tens of thousands of other people's kids to do that. Um, you know, there's, there's no excuse for not standing up uh, against that structure of power. So, uh, 60 minutes uh, suddenly out of nowhere for some reason deciding to mention uh, the 28 pages of the 9-11 report about Saudi Arabia that, that have been blacked out uh, and all of the people in that report willing to say, make these pages public, they're doing the right thing. They're saying, you know, this, this secrecy uh, this abuse of power ought to end. Whether it ends or not depends on how many of us say it how loudly uh, and, and how much we continue to disturb those in power. You know, the, the idea that wars and militarism are good for the U.S. economy and that that somehow justifies them uh, it, it is really probably the most embarrassing thing in my mind, when I travel outside the United States, to be aware of, to realize that somebody might ask me about, to hear respected politicians in the United States justifying militarism as a jobs program, um, you know, because even if it were true, it would be so incredibly evil. But it isn't true, uh, and the economics is very clear, uh, and the studies that have been done at University of Massachusetts Amherst that most of you are probably familiar with uh, have shown very clearly that spending the same money on infrastructure or education or even on tax cuts for working people, not what we understand as tax cuts you know, for billionaires, but actually tax cuts for you and me, would create more jobs and in some of those cases much better paying jobs than the militarism. So that if you transitioned 
from a military economy to a peaceful economy, there would be so much savings in the process that you could retool and retrain, uh, and nobody uh, other than you know a subset of corporate profiteers who are focused on war uh, would suffer in any way. Uh, you know, and this is this is something that we need to be doing, and that some states in recent years and some localities in recent years have been working on, and uh, it's sadly motivated in large part by the false idea that the military in Washington was being slashed, uh, and they would have to convert to something uh, because of that. In fact, military spending has been increasing in recent years in Washington. Uh, but there are, you know, federal government programs that actually provide money to localities to work on transition to peaceful economies, uh, and that's something you can go to your city council and town council and county board and, and urge on them, uh, and it is what needs to be done. I mean, but the idea that the economy is benefiting from dumping all of this money into this destructive enterprise uh, it is just is just false it, on simple economic terms. But it would be grotesquely immoral, even if true. Well, because looking for an understanding of what impact they had, we were looking at U.S. corporate media outlets that had no interest in telling us what impact they had. Uh, the fact is that the single biggest day of protest in world history on February 15, 2003, motivated numerous national governments around the world to oppose the U.S.-driven war on Iraq and to refuse to join the coalition of the so-called willing, no matter how many bribes or threats were offered, and collectively moved the United Nations to say no to authorizing that war, which George W. Bush was desperate to get the United Nations to do, to please Tony Blair, who kind of sort of still cared about laws. And uh, that's a significant result, because that made the Iraq War, although it went forward, illegal, illicit, scandalous, so that for the next decade, people were in the streets protesting and demanding that this crime be ended, rather than that this humanitarian UN authorized enterprise be ended. And it was a much better way to protest, and it built such an understanding of what it means to resist crime on a global scale, that in 2013, which is one of my favorite examples of many times that we've had an impact, uh, in 2013, uh, when President Obama had promised John McCain and the others on Capitol Hill that he was going to bomb the hell out of Syria. I mean, this was going to be a massive bombing campaign, according to what Seymour Hersh dug up. Uh, and, and the Northrop Grumman stock was a record height in history. Every media outlet said the bombs were about to fall. Uh, you know, there was no question. This was the leadership of both political parties. Uh, was for this. Syria was about to receive some wonderful humanitarian missile strikes. President Obama, according to, you know, admits in this recent uh, article in uh, The Atlantic that largely because of public pressure and the Brits' public pressure and the House of Commons saying no for the first time since Yorktown and Congress making clear it would say no because of public pressure. I mean, this was a, this was a perfect storm built on a decade of education and agitation and Jewish holidays and APAC out of town and congressional break and congressional events with people confronting their Congress members saying, why are we getting in the, in, in the new war on the side of Al-Qaeda? And you had Congress members saying, I don't want to be the jerk who votes for another Iraq. That was the big fear. That had prevented Hillary Clinton in the good old days from running for president, from winning a primary, the, the vote for Iraq, which had become a badge of shame, not a badge of honor. Uh, and so, you know, the, the U.S. government, again, its biggest lie is that it pays no attention to us. I was just talking with a professor over at American University earlier today named, uh, named uh, Peter uh, Kuznick, who told me, he's constantly telling me things that John Dean admitted to him. John Dean told him that President Nixon had him assigned to follow the anti-war movement, study everything the anti-war movement does. Right? The White House now, I guarantee you, has people assigned to do just that. Uh, when uh, 
Lawrence Whitner, who I mentioned in, in my remarks, uh, was interviewing former uh, White House officials decades later about the nuclear freeze movement uh, and had gotten the official in charge of a major operation to study and sabotage it, uh, to admit that. He then went to, to Ed Meese, the, uh, the, the jurist who famously said uh, that innocent, if you're innocent, you're not prosecuted. Uh, he, he went to Ed Meese and said, did the White House pay any attention to the, to the nuclear freeze movement? He said, oh no. And then he said, well, you know, the guy in charge of it told me this, this, and that. And Ed Meese got a big grin and said, well, yeah, I admit it. You know, they don't want to admit that we have any impact at all. But in 2006, Mitch McConnell was telling George W. Bush, you better get the hell out of Iraq or the Republicans were all going to get voted out of Congress. It's in Bush's book. Right? But in 2006, the Democrats were given majorities in both houses on the overwhelming mandate to end the war in Iraq, the top issue in every exit poll. And Rahm Emanuel went to the Washington Post and said, you know what? Running against that war works so well, we're going to keep it around for two more years. We're going to run against it, quote unquote, against it again in 2008. So, you know, there's, there's an impact, but then there has to be a follow through. If the, if the impact is sufficient to vote out all the Republicans, but then you go home and, oh, we're job is done, let's shut down the peace movement because we elected Democrats, and the Democrats say, what a bunch of suckers, we're going to run against the same war two years from now if we can just keep it going. Well, then the impact is diminished significantly. You know? um, but that we can stop a war, that we can put through a nuclear agreement with Iran when senators are screaming that we must have a war instead, and, and, and prevent that war in 2007 and in 2015 and over and over again, to the point where now if they say we urgently need a war on Iran, we can say why when we've been stopping it for 20 something years, you know, it, that, that's, you know, that's the power of activism when people decide to do something. Um, it, you know, if, if people in this country responded and turned out in the streets the way they do in Iceland, we would have the government we want. Uh, you know, one big part is your sources of information. People who follow the corporate media, who get their news from the corporate media, uh, and statistically often you can use older people as, uh, as a substitute for that, uh, tend to believe certain lies, uh, including 